Hello, and welcome back to another episode. Today we're examining two major events set to occur within the next six months or so that will strain an already bruised banking system in the U.S. In March this year, several banks collapsed, causing depositor flight to safe havens such as gold. In the wake of Silicon Valley Bank's insolvency, gold rallied from about $1,820 per ounce to over $2,050 per ounce. The result of all this was one of the longest, most intense surges in gold demand we've seen over the past 20 years. All this begging the question, what's next? Stay tuned and find out. Okay, so 2023 has been a wild ride so far. We mentioned that we had a massive, prolonged surge in gold demand. Much of that movement out of savings accounts and into gold has completed and normal gold buying trends have resumed. But is this the calm before the storm? There are two major events set to impact the financial system in the US. The first one has to do with the debt ceiling. I know that everyone is breathing a sigh of relief that part of our political theater is over, but the ramifications have yet to be felt. With the debt ceiling raised and a budget agreed upon, the US government now needs to acquire the dollars it pledged. And the Treasury Department desperately needs to refill its war chest. What better way to do that than to borrow money? And the way we're going to do that is with Treasury bills. Now, if you're not familiar with T-bills, here's a quick overview. Treasury bills are short-term debt instruments or loans issued by the government to finance its activities and manage cash flow. They're considered one of the safest forms of investment since they are backed by the full faith and credit of the government. T-bills are issued in different types based on their maturity periods, which determine their characteristics and return potential. For example, a four-week T-bill is called a one-month T-bill, while a 52-week T-bill is called a one-year T-bill. Generally, longer maturity T-bills tend to offer higher yields compared to shorter term ones. The way it works is you buy a T-bill at a discount, then you receive the full face value at maturity. They're easy to get into and low risk, so how does this affect our banks? Well, the banks are under threat right now from depositor flight. That's what caused Silicon Valley Bank's collapse, and it's taken down several other banks as well. A few, like PacWest, are hanging on but under risk. Banks have a, you know, relatively simple business model. People put money in the bank, the bank lends that money to other people, the bank profits on the loan. If depositors come and ask for their money back, the bank is required to give it to them. If they don't have the money, the bank fails and the government steps in. The problem with this model is that banks are incentivized to lend as much capital as possible. There aren't any banks out there that could hand back 100% of their depositors' money. The average interest rate for savings accounts is just 0.25%. This means if you have a million dollars in a savings account, you'd make 2,500 bucks in interest from the bank. That's a sad return on investment. T-bills are getting people about 5% right now. So if you took your money out of the bank and put a million into a T-bill, you could get $50,000 back in interest. It's a serious competitive problem for banks. Well, how big of a problem is this? Analysts at the Deutsche Bank are estimating the total T-bills issued for the year to sit at $1.6 trillion. Trillion with a T. They state, The Treasury General account has fallen to an alarmingly low level this week, and the subsequent rebuild will likely be one of the largest in debt limit history. Now, that was reported on June 6th. Just before the debt limit bill was signed, the cash balance was $23.4 billion. Analysts at TD Securities were quoted as saying, Everyone knows the flood is coming. Yields will move higher because of this flood. Treasury bills will cheapen further, and that will put pressure on banks. TD analysts estimate an additional $1.1 trillion in new debt from the U.S. Treasury. Money is expected to be sucked out of the savings accounts and flow into T-bills. In response, the banks may be forced to raise their rates to try and keep their depositors, which will, of course, squeeze their margins when they're already in a dangerous state. Now, J.P. Morgan also estimated the combined performance of 
stocks and bonds this year will suffer by nearly 5% due to the debt issuance and the effect of the Federal Reserve's quantitative tightening. This only further agitates financial flight and sends dollars into new investments that are more secure or more stable, perceived to be safer. If depositor flight reoccurs from this and more banks fail, that could precipitate yet another migration into gold. Well, that's the first shockwave. But the next one is also nothing to sneeze at. We're looking at the commercial real estate problem where banks are now taking impairments. Goldman Sachs CEO David Solomon said his bank will disclose markdowns on commercial real estate holdings in light of higher interest rates and the remote work revolution. Those impairments are expected to be taken this quarter, which will be a painful correction to years of low interest rates and high valuations. A combination of higher vacancy rates and higher borrowing costs is to blame. About two-thirds of the industry's commercial real estate loans are issued and held by regional and mid-size institutions that are, you know, they're just less well-positioned to take a hit. Now, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen acknowledged that the commercial real estate sector would have some quote-unquote, issues in the future in a recent appearance on CNBC. She also stated, there is motivation to see some consolidation, and it wouldn't surprise me to see some of that going forward, in reference to smaller banks feeling the impact. And then she also said, and and I'm paraphrasing a little, I think banks are broadly preparing for some restructuring and difficulties going ahead. Now, the word consolidation is the lingo used to encompass a broad array of outcomes for businesses that fail and are gobbled up by competitors or industry. For example, when Credit Suisse failed earlier this year, UBS bought them and their assets at basement prices. There, that was a uh, consolidation. And restructuring is also code for a broad range of activities that often include things like layoffs, closing branches and divisions, or selling struggling business units. So keep your ears open for those code words, consolidation and restructuring, especially when people are talking about our banks. Those words are flying around a lot these days, and it means that people making decisions are expecting system failures. So there you have it. Two big shockwaves expected to hit banks that are already feeling pain. How does gold play into this? Well, the same way it always does. It acts as a reliable and safe store of value in uncertain times. Now, why would someone invest in gold right now instead of T-bills? Ah, glad you asked. There are two words you should get familiar with. Counterparty risk. Counterparty risk is the probability that the other party in an investment will not fulfill its obligations, go into default, and leave the investor high and dry. Silicon Valley bank failing is a good example. People who trusted the bank with their money almost lost it all. The government had not stepped in and promised to make all depositors whole, even those with deposits in excess of $250,000 that was insured by the FDIC. There would be a lot of people who lost near everything for them. Almost all investments have counterparty risk, and things like bond ratings exist to help people assess what that risk is. A bond with a AAA rating is lower yield, lower risk, while junk bonds offer huge, uh, huge yields because the counterparty risk is just so high. Even the U.S. government has counterparty risk. In 2011, Standard & Poor's shocked the world by downgrading U.S. government from its AAA status to AA+. But gold does not have counterparty risk. If you physically hold gold, you hold it. It's that simple. It is tangible. It cannot disappear. You don't have to worry about some entity defaulting because someone forgot to cross the T's and dot the I's. And the wealthy know this. They're the ones who are moving big money out of banks and into other areas like gold. They have a lot more to lose, and consequently, they have a lot more to save. And that means we will often see big monetary outflows from risk-laden assets into gold and other precious metals whenever something big happens, regardless of the yield, because it's not about the yield. Gold doesn't yield anything. It preserves. That is its main role, and that's what it will continue to do. That's all we have for you today. Please remember to like, subscribe, share with a friend. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.